Daily Minutes 1473 met een uitzending van vandaag 18 november 2018. Dit is het bulletin van zondag. The last part of this bulletin will be in English, but we will first start with some things in Dutch. Vandaag een extra lange uitzending met op het laatst meerdere items in het Engels, waaronder het nieuws van de RSTB. Ik begin vandaag gewoon omdat ik daar zin in heb met twee columns die helemaal niets met de zendhobby te maken hebben. Oma's pakpapier. In Florida wonen traditioneel veel senior citizens, ouderen, die zich als ze genoeg van al dat mooie weer en die occasional tornado hebben natuurlijk helemaal te pletter vervelen. Een aantal van die oudjes zijn nu een bedrijf begonnen. Je kunt daar als buitenlander voor 100 dollar per jaar een Amerikaans postadres huren. Veel bedrijven in de VS, je ziet dat ook op eBay vaak, zijn zo patriotisch dat ze niet aan klanten buiten hun eigen land willen leveren of hooguit ook alleen in Canada daarnaast. Als waar je met je gold of platinum kaart, ze zijn niet te vermurven. Dat probleem hoef je niet te hebben. Je kunt via het bedrijf van de oudjes gewoon vanaf een Amerikaanse rekening betalen en de bestelling naar een adres in Florida laten sturen. Pronto. Sterker nog, de lieve grijsharige dametjes en heren sturen het ook nog voor je naar Europa. Op de manier zoals senior citizens bekend staan om te doen. In gewoon grauw ouderwets verpakkingspapier met een stukje sisaltouw eromheen. Adres wordt er met grote hanenpoten in filtstift opgeschreven. Tien keer zo weinig kans dat het pakje daardoor bij een controle op de te betalen btw en invoerrecht wordt opengemaakt. Formeel hoor je als je zo'n pakket als het door de controle slipt natuurlijk achteraf wel netjes in Nederland bij de belastingontvanger aan te geven. De methode is overigens ook als je dat aangeven af en toe vergeet zowel in de VS als in Nederland geheel legaal. De website van de firma is myus.com. Mike Yankee, uniformshera.com. Het is jammer dat Rob PD4ROB waarschijnlijk niet meeluistert. Uh, een van zijn favorieten vind ik zelf ook wel erg leuk. Maar misschien kan ik hem nog bereiken voordat de uitzending begint. Bosco, de hond die burgemeester werd. Ik zag een tijdje terug in het programma Monumental Mysteries op Travel Channel een item waarvan ik het niet kan laten om even over te schrijven. In het plaatsje Soenol, Californië in de VS, dat nooit een burgemeester had gehad, ontstond in 1981 onder de bevolking het idee dat het van belang zou kunnen zijn om toch zo'n vertegenwoordiger van de bevolking te hebben. In de aanloop naar de verkiezingen ontstond vervolgens in een kroeg bij het gesprek tussen twee mannen het idee om de hond van een van beiden verkiesbaar te stellen. Bosco, de een jaar oude Labrador Retriever en Roodwaler Mix, was een bekende verschijning in het plaatsje. Zodanig dat menig politicus er jaloers op zou zijn. Het vrolijke, menslievende dier liep vaak zonder eigenaar door het plaatsje en eigenlijk bijna iedereen had het beest wel eens geaaid. En zo werd Bosco niet alleen de eerste eenjarige ter wereld die burgemeester werd, maar ook de eerste op vier voeten. Hij versloeg met glans de twee menselijke kandidaten op de lijst. Het dier kweet zich vervolgens vol overgave van zijn taak. Het liefst door mensen omringd woonde het dier, zoals het ook een menselijke burgemeester betaamt, graag alle officiële gelegenheden bij. De bewoners van Soenol vonden het fantastisch en de landelijke media ook. Zeker nadat een Britse krant verslag van de verkiezingen had gedaan, was het dier enige tijd niet uit de media weg te slaan. En zo kwam het dat Bosco negen jaar later een rol ging spelen in de wereldpolitiek. In 1990 vonden de protesten plaats op het Tiananmenplein in Peking. Chinezen eisten daar meer democratie. In een poging om de belachelijkheid van de democratie en het verkiezingsproces in de Verenigde Staten aan de kaak te stellen, pikte het regime in China de berichten over Bosco op om zo te laten zien dat zelfs de Amerikanen niet met die zware verantwoordelijkheid van de democratie om konden gaan. Dat plan had een averechts effect. Bosco kwam in de wereldpers vervolgens juist naar voren als het toonbeeld van die democratie. Bosco leidde toen de storm daarover weer ging liggen opnieuw gewoon het redelijk anonieme bestaan van de burgemeester van een plaatsje van zo'n 900 inwoners. Hij bleef dat tot aan zijn dood in 1994 en is daarna altijd de enige burgemeester van Soenol gebleven omdat de plaatsje vond dat niemand in zijn poot afdrukken zou kunnen staan. Sinds 2008 staat er in Soenol een standbeeld van de bijzondere burgemeester.
Massive and expensive equipment marks the professional radio station. But in the amateur field, radio parts often include pieces of assorted junk ingeniously assembled by operators who are called hams and who take up broadcasting as a hobby. Hello, this is Bob McCready, G0FGX, with the TX Talk podcast of the GB2 RS News from the Radio Society of Great Britain for Sunday the 18th of November 2018. The news headlines, first geostationary amateur satellite success, new RSGB convention videos on YouTube, and Lithuania and Montenegro get 60 metres. On Thursday, the 15th of November, a SpaceX Falcon 9 vehicle lifted off flawlessly at 2046 UTC from Cape Canaveral. It was carrying the first amateur radio payload destined for geostationary orbit. About 32 minutes after launch, SpaceX reports the spacecraft was successfully deployed into a geostationary transfer orbit. Positioned at 25.5 degrees east, the satellite will carry an amateur radio S-band and X-band payload capable of linking radio amateurs from Brazil to Thailand. The recent subject of an AMSAT UK colloquium presentation, S Hale 2 carries two Phase 4 non-inverting amateur radio transponders, operating in a 2.4 gigs up and 10.45 gigs down configuration. This offers a 250 kHz bandwidth linear transponder intended for conventional analog operations, plus an 8 MHz bandwidth transponder for experimental digital modulation schemes and DVB amateur television. You can see the talk at youtube.com slash user slash AMSAT UK in capitals slash videos. So that's youtube.com slash user slash AMSAT UK in capital letters slash videos. Two more 2018 RSGB convention talks are now on YouTube. Using drones to measure antenna radiation patterns by Jenny Bailey, Golf Zero, Victor Quebec Hotel, looks at how antenna radiation patterns are difficult to measure because antennas are typically high above the ground. A practical method of measuring the radiation field around an antenna could be with a drone. The video deals with the CAA restrictions, drone selection, payload and operation, as well as measurement, antenna design and plotting the results. The second video is an introduction to SDRs and GNU radio by Heather Lomond, Mike Zero, Hotel Mike Oscar. She gives an overview of what is an software-defined radio, the types of tasks they could do for us, and how to get started with them, as well as an introduction to some digital signal processing techniques such as IQ modulation, filters, DDS, and FFT demodulation. Go to rsgb.org slash videos, click on the RSGB convention lectures section, and then the RSGB 2018 convention icon if you want to view the these videos. A new WSJTX release candidate version 2.0.0-RC4 is now available and the version 2.0 quick start guide has been revised and extended. The developers urge anybody upgrading to the new version to read the release notes thoroughly and the upgrade requires users to change operator settings so that the software may not work straight out of the box when upgrading from previous versions. The latest version of WSJTX also removes compatibility with earlier versions of the software in certain circumstances. It is vital that we contribute to the debate around spectrum use. Former RSGB president Graham Murchie, Golf 4 Foxtrot Sierra Golf, recently made a presentation on behalf of all UK radio amateurs to the UK Spectrum Policy Forum. Now, this is a body that advises the government. He also led the subsequent discussion, supported by RSGB General Manager Steve Thomas, Mike One, Alpha Charlie Bravo, and RSGB Spectrum Foreman Chair Murray Neiman, Golf 6 Juliet Yankee Bravo. Topics included the shortage of practical skills in the radio arena, the social and economic aspects of spectrum use, and examples of where the RSGB is encouraging development of scarce skills and using them to good effect. You can see the presentations at tinyurl.com slash gb2rs hyphen 1811a. So that's tinyurl.com slash gb2rs hyphen 1811a. And the gb2rs, that's in capital letters, and the a at the end is a capital letter as well. Lithuania and Montenegro are the latest countries active on 60 metres. Lithuania's telecoms regulator has enabled the new WRC 15 secondary allocation, which is 5351.5 to 5366.5 kilohertz at 15 watts EIRP in its 2018 update to the country's frequency allocation table. The latest update to the Montenegro National Frequency Plan lists a new band at 5 megahertz, namely the WRC 15 amateur secondary allocation of 5351.5 to 
5366.5 kilohertz with 15 watts EIRP and that's been confirmed by their national society the Montenegro Amateur Radio Pool. As from Sunday the 18th at 18.30 UTC, Eddie, Golf Zero, Victor Victor Tango will be reading GB2 RS News on GB7ST Slot 2 Talk Group 9. This is the DMR repeater in Stoke-on-Trent. At the same time, he'll read the news on 433.525 MHz and GB3SX, the 6-metre repeater in Stoke-on-Trent. Thanks go to Eddie and all the other news readers who give freely of their time to serve their fellow radio amateurs. The RSGB has appointed Sarah McGarvey to India's Zero Sierra Sierra Whiskey into the new role of the Youth Committee Champion. The role will include managing the UK attendance at the Yota Camp each year and Yota Month every December. The next advanced distance learning course to be run by the Bath-based team is due to start on the 1st of February 2019, aiming for an exam in July or August. Course places are limited and the last four were completely filled well before the start date, so if you are interested in joining, you need to contact the course leader, who is Steve, Golf Zero, Foxtrot Uniform Whiskey. Contact him without delay via email to g0fuw at tiskily.co.uk. g0fuw at tiskily.co.uk. Now, now, a date for next year's diary, the RSGB AGM is going to be held on the 27th of April 2019 at Jury's Inn, 245 Broad Street, Birmingham, and the postcode B12HQ. The Society's accounts and reports for 2018 will appear in the April 2019 RADCOM. Three of ITUR Study Group 5 working groups meet in Geneva between the 5th and the 16th of November. Working Party 5A deals with the land mobile service above 30 MHz, wireless access in the fixed service and the amateur uh, satellite services. Working Group 5A1 is responsible for amateur matters and is chaired by Dale Victor Kilo 1, Delta Sierra Hotel. And the main topic there is to develop a technical report to support the Work for World Radio Communication Conference 2019 agenda item 11, uh, considering an allocation of the frequency band 50 to 54 megahertz to the amateur radio service in Region 1. The working group consists of a mix of radio amateurs from all three IARU regions, administrations from all over the world and other interested parties like meteorologists and the military. Next up, we've got the details of rallies and events for the coming week and the Nevada Radio and Waters and Stanton Open Day takes place on Sunday the 18th. It's at Nevada Radio, 1 Fitzherbert Spur, Portsmouth, Papa Oscar 6, 1 Tango Tango, and doors are open from 10am to 4.30pm. Major manufacturers will be in attendance to demonstrate their latest radios. There's a free burger and coffee too between 11 and 2 for every attendee. And the main warehouse will be open to customers to wander around and pick up many one-off deals on the day or pick through a large selection of vintage and used radio equipment. See nevadaradio.co.uk for more details. Also on Sunday the 18th, the 41st Cats Radio and Electronics Bazaar is at Oasis Academy, Homefield Road, Coolsdon. Charlie Romeo 5, 1 Echo Sierra is the postcode. There's free car parking, doors open at 10, with admission being £1.50. You'll find trade stands, special interest groups, refreshments and more. Andy, Golf Zero, Kilo Zulu Tango could tell you more, and he's on 0772 986 6600. 0772 986 6600. The Plymouth Radio Rally takes place on Sunday the 18th at Harewood House, Church Road, Plimpton, Papa Lima 7, 1 November Hotel. Doors open at 10.30 in the morning and there's a £2 entrance fee. For details, you need to email d.beck123 at outlook.com. d.beck123 at outlook.com. Next Sunday, the 25th, the Bishop Auckland ARC Rally will take place at Spennymore Leisure Centre. That's at 32 High Street, Spennymore, County Durham, and the postcode Delta Lima 166 Delta Bravo. This venue has good parking and access to a large ground floor hall. Doors open at 10.30 in the morning, 10.15am for disabled visitors. Added admission is £2, accompanied under 14s free, and there'll be the usual radio, computer, electronics and bring and buy stores, as well as catering and bar facilities. Talk-ins on S22. John, Golf 4, Lima Romeo Golf can tell you more. 01388 606 396 01388 606 396 and remember if you want to get your event into radcom and gb2rs send the details as early as possible please to radcom at rsgb.org.uk we need to know at least three to four months in advance to get your information into radcom 
Now the DX News from 425 DX News and other sources. And we start with Nick Victor Echo 3 Echo Yankee, who's going to be active as 9 Yankee 4 slash Victor Echo 3 Echo Yankee from Trinidad. The IOTA reference for that one, SA011. This is between the 19th and the 26th of November, including an entry in the CQ Worldwide DXCW contest. QSL is via Victor Echo 3 Echo Yankee, Club Logs OQRS and Logbook of the World. UE Delta Lima 8 Uniform Delta will be active as Hotel Charlie 5 Mike from Cuenca in Ecuador between the 21st and 28th of November. This one also includes an entry in the CQ Worldwide DXCW contest. Outside the contest, he will operate SSB and CW on the 160 to 10 metre bands QSL via Delta Lima 8 Uniform Delta Direct or via the Bureau. A team will be active as Juliet 8, Nancy Yankee from St Vincent, and uh, that's NA109 between the 21st and 28th of November. They'll be operating all modes, including FT8 on the 160 to 6 metre bands, and will participate in the CQ Worldwide DXCW contest. QSL for that one via Victor Echo 7, November Yankee, and Logbook of the World. Alex, Kilowatt 2, Bravo, Bravo, and Pavel, Uniform, Uniform, Zero, Juliet, Romeo, are going to be active as 5, Romeo, 8, Uniform, Mike, from Nosy B, and that's AF057 for its IOTA number, and that's in Madagascar, between the 19th and 26th of November, including an entry in the CQ Worldwide DXCW contest. Plans are to use the 160 to 6 metre bands on CW, SSB, FT8, and JT65A. They're also going to give 6 metre EME a try, and it's QSL via our club logs, OQRS, and Logbook of the World. Pierre, Hotel Bravo 9, Alpha Mike Oscar, is going to be active as 5 Uniform 9, Alpha Mike Oscar, from near me in Niger from the 20th of November to the 3rd of December. He'll be operating CW on the 160 to 10 metre bands, including participation in the CQ Worldwide DXCW contest, and it's QSL via Mike Zero Uniform Romeo X-Rays, OQRS, and Logbook of the World. Rich, November Zero, Hotel Juliet Zulu will be active as Charlie Six Alpha Romeo Whiskey from Grand Bahama and the IOTA reference November Alpha 080 between the 20th and the 28th of November. He will be competing in the CQ Worldwide DXCW contest. Operation outside the contest will be on SSB, CW and RTTY. QSL via Logbook of the World or direct to November Zero, Hotel Juliet Zulu. And finally, Audi, Delta Uniform 1, Zulu Delta Romeo, and Gazelle, Delta Uniform 1, Zulu Delta Quebec, are going to be active as Delta Zulu 1A slash Delta Uniform 2 from Basco, Batan Island, Ocean Charlie 093 on the 19th and 20th of November. Main frequencies will be 7055 and 14260 kHz. We've got no special event news this week, so remember you need to send details of your special events to radcom at rsgb.org.uk and do that as early as possible, and that'll get you some free publicity on GB2RS in Radcom and online. And, of course, as we always say, UK special event stations must be open to the public, so a bit of free publicity can help make your efforts more widely known. Contests now, and Sunday the 18th sees the UK Microwave Group's low band contest running from 1000 to 1400 UTC. Using all modes on the 1.3 to 3.4 gigahertz bands, the exchange is signal report, serial number and locator. On Tuesday, the 1.3 GHz UK Activity Contest runs from 2000 UTC to 2230 UTC. Using all modes, the exchange is signal report, serial number and locator. On Wednesday, the Autumn Series Contest runs from 2000 UTC to 2130 UTC. This is the SSB leg and is on the 80 metre band. The exchange is signal report and serial number. The big contest this month is the CQ Worldwide DXCW contest over the 24th and 25th. Conditions are unlikely to be good, but at least CW is a narrowband mode, so really weak signals should be more copyable than on other modes. It starts at 0000 UTC on the 24th and runs until 2359 UTC on the 25th using all contest bands from 1.8 to 28 MHz and the exchange is signal report and CQ zone, which, remember for the UK, is 14. 
And finally, for this broadcast of the GB2 RS News, the radio propagation report compiled by Golf Zero Kilo Yankee Alpha, Golf 3 Yankee Lima Alpha and Golf 4 Bravo Alpha Oscar on Friday the 16th of November. The predicted bad geomagnetic conditions forecast for last weekend didn't turn out to be quite so bad after all. The KP index only rose to 4 on the 10th and then conditions settled again despite a large coronal hole on the sun's surface. However, reports did come in of poor conditions on 80 metres on Monday Monday evening during the RSGB 80 metre autumn series contest. A good guide for conditions for inter-G or near vertical incident skywave propagation is always the ionosond data at propquest.co.uk. The site showed that the critical frequency, which is the maximum frequency at which signals launched vertically into the ionosphere are returned, dropped as low as 3.16 MHz on Monday evening. This so-called critical frequency, or FOF2, meant the ionosphere couldn't support close-in 80-metre signals. They basically carried on out into space rather than being returned to Earth. This may be a trend we see in the evenings throughout the winter, especially with the solar flux index as low as 67, as we have been seeing. The only answer is to move to top band or make do with VHF and UHF. Next week, NOAA predicts more of the same with an SFI of around 68 to 70. Geomagnetic conditions are predicted to be more settled, though, with a maximum KP index of 2. This means daytime maximum usable frequencies are likely to be around 18 or 19 megahertz over a 3,000 kilometre path. There have been the occasional openings during the day up to 21 and even 28 megahertz, but these are likely to be fleeting and generally unreliable. Nighttime MUFs over a 3,000 thousand kilometer path may struggle to reach 9 to 12 megahertz at times with 40 or more likely 80 meters being the highest reliable band for dx now the vhf and up propagation news it looks like a good tropo spell is coming up especially over the eastern side of the country with some good paths across the north sea to northern europe and scandinavia this is due to a strong temperature inversion set up by a large area of high pressure over scandinavia as this high drifts away towards iceland the tropo will decline and low pressure will take over over for southern areas by midweek. This could introduce some coastal showers, especially along the English Channel and over the southern North Sea, which may bring some chance of rain scatter for the microwave bands. On Sunday, we should still be in the tail of the Leonid meteor shower, so look out for enhanced meteor scatter paths. And moon declination goes positive on Monday, so the week will see increasingly long moon windows and path losses will fall as the week progresses. And that's all from the propagation team for this week and for this broadcast of the GB2RS News. Now, if you'd like to see a full transcript of this broadcast, you'll find it at the RSGB website under news. And for the local news for your area, tune into the amateur radio station that provides that service for where you live or you can also find a transcript of the local news at the RSGB website. I'm Bob McCready, G0FGX and this has been the TX Talk podcast of the GB2 RS News from the Radio Society of Great Britain. The old pilot's plane tails. One of our aircraft is missing. I'm a bit of a fan of old black and white wartime movies. Classics like The Cruel Sea, The Dam Busters, 12 O'Clock High and One of Our Aircraft is Missing. The title of that last one brought to mind the continuing speculation that surrounds the fate of Malaysia Flight 370, the Boeing 777 that disappeared over the South China Sea en route from Kuala Lumpur to Beijing. Whilst that is fairly recent and well known to most of us, there are a few other fascinating stories to be found in the dusty drawers of history. Let's take, for example, the case of Begich and Boggs. They were aboard a Cessna 310 out of Anchorage, bound for Juneau in Alaska. The date was the 16th of October 1972, and they were on a political junket, since Nick Begich was a member of the U.S. House of Representatives from Alaska, and Hale Boggs was the House Majority Leader, for the House of Representatives, and a member of the Warren Commission. The only other passenger was Russell Brown, an aide. 
The aircraft was operated by Pan Alaska Airways, but perhaps surprisingly, the pilot was only able to fly under visual flight rules, since he was the only pilot on board and the machine had no autopilot. Since the pilot was also the president of Pan Alaska and the chief pilot, it seems that he was well qualified for the flight ahead, but the weather did not look conducive to a flight under visual conditions. Departing from Anchorage, they set course to follow the airway Victor 317 and contacted the flight service station for the latest weather information. The flight service station specialist confirmed that they had appropriate emergency gear and a locator beacon on board, and then passed the pilot the weather for Cordova, Yakuta, Sitka and Juneau, plus the pertinent area forecasts. Ahead of the small craft was the Chugach mountain range, and the conditions along that proposed flight were not appropriate for a flight under visual rules. Indeed, their route followed the Portage Pass, which led through the high ground and was forecast to be closed due to weather. After speaking to Anchorage Flight Service, nothing more was ever heard from the Cessna. On board the aircraft, there was supposed to be an extensive survival kit, including food for each person for two weeks, and also an emergency locator transmitter. Since the aircraft itself wasn't equipped with an ELT, the pilot was supposed to be carrying a portable emergency transmitter. The chief pilot's personal ELT was found after his aircraft was reported missing, in the cabin of another Pan Alaska's aircraft at Fairbanks. When the aircraft became overdue for its arrival at Juneau, a search was initiated, and considering the importance of the passengers, it was thorough and extensive. Almost immediately, an airborne HC-130 Hercules was diverted from its mission to commence a search that, for its time, became one of the most extensive in aviation history. Search areas were established which covered thousands of square miles and were covered numerous times by aircraft of the U.S. Air Force, the U.S. Army, the U.S. Coast Guard, the Civil Air Patrol, as well as civil aircraft and helicopters. In addition, U.S. Coast Guard cutters, merchant marine and fishing vessels covered the Prince William Sound, the Gulf of Alaska and the Icy Straits area. Much of Portage Pass was also searched twice by ground personnel. Even after 39 days of intensive effort, neither the wreckage of the plane nor the pilots' and passengers' remains were ever found. The events surrounding the crash led to much speculation, suspicion and numerous conspiracy theories most of which centred on Boggs' membership of the Warren Commission, which was investigating the assassination of President J.F. Kennedy. Intriguingly, Boggs had dissented from the Commission's majority who supported the single-bullet theory, commenting that he had strong doubts about it. The previous year, Boggs had also made a speech on the floor of the House, strongly attacking the FBI director, J. Edgar Hoover, and the whole of the FBI. A month later, he went even further, stating that, Over the post-war years, we have granted to the elite and secret police within our system vast new powers over the lives and liberties of the people. At the request of the trusted and respected heads of those forces and their appeal to the necessities of national security, we have exempted those grants of power from due accounting and strict surveillance. There is a bound as to why the aircraft went down and why it has never been found, none of which were lessened following the publication of a book by Robert Ludlam the Matarese Circle, 
in which Ludlam suggests that Boggs was murdered to stop his investigation into the Kennedy assassination. Now, someone else of a rather different ilk also went missing in the wilds of North America. The Flying Bandit was a Canadian criminal with a remarkable record of nefarious deeds. Ken Leishman was born in Holland, Manitoba, and grew up in a troubled home. Working as a mechanic, he learned to fly and purchased an old Eronka aircraft, which he used to fly between the farms he visited for work. When the repair company he worked for closed, he decided to make his money in less honourable ways. His first theft was in 1957 in Toronto, when, posing as a friend of a bank manager, he talked his way into the manager's office to supposedly chat about a business loan. Once inside, he produced a gun and used it to persuade the manager to write him a cheque for $10,000. He questioned the poor man about his life and family and then coerced him to take him to a teller and cash the cheque, whilst using the knowledge he had gained to appear as his friend. Afterwards, he took the man with him to his getaway car and then let him go. A few months later, he tried the same trick again, but in a different Toronto bank. This manager was made of sterner stuff and refused to go along with Leishman, despite being threatened with the gun. Realising that the game was up, the flying bandit tried to make his escape, but was tripped up by a lady customer and then tackled by a teller less than a block from the bank. He was arrested and sentenced to 12 years. After being released on parole, he tried to make his way as a door-to-door salesman, but with a wife and seven children to support he soon went back to a life of crime. His next theft was on a much grander scale, when he and four accomplices stole $385,000 of gold bullion worth well over $2.5 million in today's currency from Winnipeg International Airport. In previous years, he used to watch the aircraft at Winnipeg and realised that gold shipments from Red Lake were being flown into the airport to then be taken by Air Canada to the Mint in Ottawa. An accomplice was sent up to Red Lake to watch for a shipment to be prepared, whilst Leishman faked some overalls and acquired a few waybills from an unoccupied Air Canada desk. When a shipment left Red Lake, Leishman and his accomplices stole an Air Canada truck drove onto the tarmac to meet the inbound aircraft and, using the stolen waybills, persuaded the loaders to put the gold onto their truck. Their plan worked like a breeze, and they drove off considerably richer than they had been that morning. They first hid the ingots in a freezer, and then a backyard, from which they planned to make a further move onto remote farmland, but a blizzard delayed them. The largest gold theft in Canada's history had, however, generated considerable attention from the police. Whilst they were waiting for the legendary blizzard of 1966 to clear, the local force, who were checking up on Leishman's associates, discovered the hall, and before long the flying bandit was back behind bars, but this time of steel. However, whilst awaiting trial, he managed to escape, along with ten others. Taking a Chevy from the parking lot and with roadblocks going up, he made his way to Steinbach. It was here that he managed to steal an aircraft, fully living up to his nickname, and with his gold heist crew, he made it across the border into the United States. 
Leishman was becoming something of a celebrity, so it didn't take long for a barman in Indiana to recognize him and call the police. He was soon being held in the Vaughan Street Jail in Winnipeg, where he managed to pick the lock of his cell, overpowered three guards, and escape again over a fence. His final bid for freedom only lasted four hours, and this time he was sentenced to 15 years. He was known to be a charming man and a model prisoner, so only eight years later he was released on parole. He had, however, turned over a new leaf. He moved to Red Lake in Ontario, where he became a bush pilot, and, with his family, opened up a tourist shop. The couple were, by all accounts, well liked by the community, and Ken Leishman even served as the chair of the local Chamber of Commerce. However, on December 14, 1979, at the age of 48, Ken was performing a medevac flight out of Red Lake when his plane disappeared in northern Ontario. The following spring, a Canadian Forces search flight found the wreckage. The bodies of the patient and medical assistant aboard were positively identified, but all they could find of Leishman was his wallet. Since there was nothing in the wreckage to prove that the flying bandit was dead, the theories abounded as to his whereabouts, especially after the coroner investigating the accident initially listed him as officially alive. Given his colourful past, there has been great interest in his life, and even a documentary, The Flying Bandit, plus a number of books, have added to his notoriety. But to this day, he has never been found. Now, theft may also have been involved in our final story. On the 30th of January 1979, a Varig Boeing 707, flight 967, departed Tokyo bound for Rio de Janeiro in Brazil via Los Angeles. About 120 miles east of Tokyo, whilst flying over the Pacific Ocean, the crew of six suddenly stopped making radio transmissions and all contact with the aircraft was lost. On board the freighter were 53 paintings from the artist Manabu Mabi, which had been in Tokyo for an exhibition and were then worth an estimated 1.24 million US dollars. Despite being relatively close to the coast of Japan, no survivors, bodies, or any sign of either the wreckage or the paintings were ever found. The searchers couldn't even find oil or fuel slicks to mark a possible crash site. Despite the art world being suspicious that the paintings might have been stolen, none have ever emerged. This wasn't the only theory, however. May I take you back to the plain tale, Hunting the Foxbat, which I told on November the 11th, 2016. In this story, a disgruntled MiG-25 pilot, Victor Belenko, defects with his aircraft to Japan. The Japanese authorities allowed the United States access to the MiG-25, which was dismantled and inspected, before being crated up and given back to the Soviet Union. However, around 20 parts were claimed to be missing, and some have suggested that these parts were being flown to the USA on board Flight 967 for further analysis. The theory goes that the Soviets intercepted and shot down or sabotaged the Varig flight to prevent the parts reaching America. 
The official report into the loss gives the flight a more likely cause for disappearance and suggests that the crew became unconscious after the aircraft depressurized and, much in the way that Malaysia Flight 370 may have done, it continued on until it finally crashed into the ocean, never to be seen again. Aircraft disappearances always seem to enliven those with vivid imaginations, whereas the actual reason for a disappearance is usually much more mundane. Accidents happen, and the world is a big place. Music by bensounds.com Daily Minutes zijn dagelijks vanaf ongeveer 1900 uur te beluisteren. De uitzending wordt een dag later om half elf ochtends herhaald. Alle mail is welkom op het adres x Dat is ook te vinden rechts boven aan de webpagina van de uitzending in www.pa0ete.nl. De Daily Minutes toont iedere dag weer aan de hand van schokkende voorbeelden hoe een hobby mensenlevens kan veranderen. De internetfaciliteiten en studio hardware voor Daily Minutes worden gesponsord door 70 megahertzshop.nl 70mhzshop.nl En microfoon naar retour.